Welcome to Liquid, San Francisco's literary festival. I'm Jack Bulwer, the co-founder and executive director of Liquid, and our festival is running right now as a hybrid festival. We have indoor events, outdoor events, live virtual events, and recorded virtual events. They run from October 7th through the 23rd. You can catch all the details at liquid.org. Today, we are honored to be able to present a virtual event showcase for Swedish author Alex Schulman and his new novel, The Survivors, a psychological thriller published by Doubleday. Alex will be in conversation with Bay Area author Bridget Quinn. Many thanks to everyone for watching today. This event is sponsored by Center for the Art of Translation and the Barbro Osher Pro Suisia Foundation with support from the Consulate General of Sweden in San Francisco. So let's meet our authors. Alex Schulman is a best-selling author and journalist and the co-host of Sweden's most popular podcast. The Survivors is his fifth novel and his international debut. It has already sold in over 30 countries. He lives in Stockholm, Sweden with his wife and their three children. And that's where he's speaking to us from live right now, Stockholm. Um, Alex will be in conversation with Bridget Quinn, who is the author of the books, She Votes, How US Women Won Suffrage, and what happened next? Broad strokes, 15, uh, oh, I'm sorry, how US women won suffrage and what happened next? That's the title of the first book. Thank the you. second book, Broad Strokes, 15 Women Who Made Art and Made History in That Order. Her next book um, concerns artistic rivalry, royal patronage, the French Revolution, 18th century feminism, and a 21st century showdown. She's speaking to us live from her home in Sonoma, California. A few things quickly before we begin. Don't forget to follow Liquake on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for our latest updates. You can also support the participants today by buying their books at Liquake's bookshelf on the bookshop.org platform. Support your local independent bookstore. We also ask for your support of the Liquake organization to allow us to continue to bring these events. We are a nonprofit based in one of the world's most expensive cities. And if you believe in keeping literature a key component of the San Francisco landscape, please consider dropping us a few dollars. Every bit helps. We accept donations on Venmo, PayPal, or directly at liquake.org. And I have to explain my background. Uh, this is the garden court of the Sheriff of the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. We are actually uh, broadcasting live from the Palace Hotel in downtown San Francisco, but our room looks really boring. And so we put up this uh, photo instead. So anyway, let's get on with the show. Please welcome Alex and Bridget. Yay. Hi, Alex. It's so nice to see you. Welcome to the Bay Area, the beautiful Bay Area. Thank I wish you, you were so. here. <laughs> yeah, no, don't talk about it. I, I, my, own, my only dream in life was, first of all, to get published in the States. And second of all, to go to the States when being yeah. published and to, you know, meet the readers and go into a, a, a Barnes & Noble bookstore and see the actual book in, in the store. And I, I thought from, you know, from day one that I was going to, you know, get there. But this, um, this c Corona thing, it just, you know, it, 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 it continues in a way that's so depressing. Yeah, and maddening for sure. Well, let me just say then to everyone who is watching right now, can you please go to your local bookstore and take a picture of Alex's book and post it somewhere that he can see it in bookstores in the United States and I will do the same. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> it's, it's a small, <laughs> a small second place to coming, but you'll come for your next book because uh, I want to start with some numbers real quick. Um, you have the biggest podcast in Sweden, one podcast. You have two brothers, three children, and you've written, um, Jack said four earlier novels. I have four earlier books that were memoirs, but it is a little, a little confusing to me if they were memoirs or novels. So I want to talk about that. But mostly I want to say, how do you do it? How do you do a weekly podcast? It comes out on Fridays and have three children and write uh, five books in not so many years. <laughs> Tell me your secrets, I'm taking notes now. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I think the the secret is that, to, I mean, I the older you get, the more, uh, the less time you need, I think. You, you just have to be smart with time and you have to work, you know, on hours where the kids are asleep and, and uh, 
you, you just have to be smart in a way. But also, I use I use the different you know outlets for uh, so I I combine them in a way. I always you know try the, the ideas for uh, for the books in my podcast. For example, I I I had this idea of of uh, a novel, The Survivors, and I thought how would it be to tell the, the, the story partly backwards? And then I, I tried that in, in the podcast. So for a couple of episodes in the podcast, I told the segments backwards just to see if, you know, if it worked out and what, what was good with that you know, uh, way, way of telling a story and what was bad about it. So I tried to combine you know, you know, the, the different parts of uh, what I do because it all comes down to storytelling in a way. I mean, I'm amazed by that because what I understand of your podcast, I'm not amazed that you that you use it that way, but that you're able to translate between the two mediums, partly because your podcast seems to me sort of funny, irreverent, um, funny, um, and The Survivors is really gripping and not, I wouldn't say a thriller, but psychologically tense. Uh, they don't, they don't seem to be from the same person in some ways. Yeah. Uh, okay. You, okay. I, you. I. I. I really. I, I. I agree. I didn't know that someone from the states could have that insight in my podcast. But. Uh, but I. But. But. It, but it's true. I. It's very much about entertain entertainment in the podcast, and I think that this book is also meant to be entertaining. But it's much more darker, and it's. It. It has much. You know, less amount of oxygen in it. You could say. But. But. I would, I would, uh, uh, nonetheless, I would say that, you know, I, in everything I do, I try to, you know, practice on how to tell a story in the best way. And uh, the podcast is, is a way of an, an exercise. And I also write columns for the biggest daily paper in Sweden called Dagens Nyheter. And that's also storytelling. So my whole life, I'm, I'm obsessed with, you know, this, how to tell a story in the best way. And that's why I read so much or I look so much on TV shows or TV series because I, I try to learn how did the masters do it and how could I, you know, be better in what I do. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, when, I'm so floored when you come out with, oh, and I also have a column <laughs> and I also watch TV. Like I'm, I need your productivity, and maybe so do a lot of people who are listening right now. No, but you, you also have, it, it seems that you also are very productive. Don't be shy. Okay, well, I don't have all those things, but it's true. I do my best. Um, you know, you've, you've written, this is the first book translated into English, but you've had bestsellers in Sweden before. They were all, I can't, I can't quite tell if they're memoirs or novels. Um, on yep. the on the Swedish covers, it says roman, which I think means novel. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's it's almost annoying that you're because you lived in Norway for a year, so you 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 know Swedish, so I can't lie to you. But it's true that I that my my, my previous books they are they are autobiographical. How do you say uh -huh. it? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's stories about my life or persons around me, but. Uh, I I always put on the novel. It's like a, a, a disclaimer. A disclaimer. <laughs> yes. So I could you know, so I could you know bend the truth uh -huh. because I always wanted to have a bit of a freedom, but they are very much um, self-experienced stories. But they are novels then. I mean, that's in service to storytelling. Right? Yes. Because sometimes yes. life doesn't give you exactly what you want. Exactly. But but then I thought. You know, after have, having done maybe four or five books about me or my family, uh, and I, I, I I'm, I'm, and and people around me were was uh, they were they were getting annoyed or they were sad or <laughs> upset, and uh, I just wanted to be free. You know, so I so I decided to let's try to make a story that uh, doesn't have directly to do with with anyone in my family, and. Uh, Let's see how it goes. And this was and this was also the first book that you know got an an, an interest from outside of this, uh, Sweden. So I was very happy. You know, now I'm very happy that I did it because because you know as I said, the the dream of 
of you know having a book out in the states is a dream that I have since I was 11 years old or something 10 or 11 I, years old yeah you but have I, you have that in your acknowledgments I, my I dream okay. has been to one day have a book published in the United States yeah and because that's I mean I don't know in in Sweden to explain because I, I can imagine that there are, are people that uh, listens that doesn't know how it is here we feel very connected to you uh, to, to the states and um, it feels like for us that uh, you are besides Norway and Finland and Denmark you are uh, you are our closest friends and uh, we will, we will, we in Europe will not forget what you did to us, did for us uh, during the Second World War, and uh, you, you will be friends forever. I mean, uh, maybe Donald Trump has made some things <laughs> that you know, it, it, uh, it has been uh, some strange years, but we really feel that we're connected to you, and and also, of course, the United States is uh, the. The, the biggest market for books in the world so if you make it there then you're then you're all done so uh, that's also a, a part of it but I can also tell you that I mean it, it's a fiction but it also has a lot of it it, it, it has to do with three three brothers and I, I have two, two brothers and we have a, an, an, an old you know, cottage house in the middle of the forest in the woods so there are very very much things that are familiar to me in this book, even though I, you know, I changed all the names and it's a fictional story, but I wanted to have one, one foot, you know, still in my life when I, when I wrote it. And you really feel that in the book. I mean, the descriptions of nature of childhood feel so alive and so immediate. Um, I'm actually, I would love it if you could sort of set up the story. I'm afraid of talking about it too much myself because I'm afraid of giving away something that might undo the beautiful tension that is carried through the book. So I'm just going to have you maybe discuss the setting or the plot or whatever, yeah. whatever you feel is correct. It, yes, it's, it, it has also to do with, you know, my life and, and things that happened to me when I, my, my mother was an alcoholic. She died five years ago and, uh, and uh, uh, just one day before her funeral, me and my two brothers, we meet, we met in my mother's apartment to clear the apartment uh, bef be uh, and uh, also to see if there were things that that we could take to remember her by and we walked around in that apartment and it was the day before her funeral and i heard this shout from from my mom's bedroom it was my bigger brother niklas that found an an, an envelope uh, where it said to my sons if if i die and it was the strangest, uh, strongest thing that I have ever experienced to, you know, to sit there. We sat down in my mother's bed and, uh, she, and he opened the letter and we, we read this note from the other side. And I, I remember that I looked down on, on the note, but also down on our feet, our socks. And I and I figured us to be you know three small boys you know when I saw our socks, and it was quite you know unbelievable to to read, and uh, then maybe three years after I thought that that moment or that scene it could actually be a, a very good frame for a a fiction story, so I I I used that. But I tell the story backwards. So the so the the book begins with three grown up men. They're sitting outside an old house in the middle of the forest. They're soaking wet. They're bleeding and they're crying and they're hugging each other. And they have a, a urn. An urn is that the word urn? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, beside them, and a police car comes down the slope. And um, I use that backwards technique because I, I thought it was, you know, it added some suspense in a way you, you could, uh, you, because then you ask yourself, okay, why are they crying and why are they wet and why are they bleeding and, and everything. And the next uh, chapter, it's uh, two hours before and they're fighting and then you ask yourself, okay, why are they fighting and so and so. So I, I could, I could add uh, a mystery to the story, which 
uh, enabled me to in the other storyline and that's the story where I tell the story of, about the brothers when the, they're boys and that story is told chronological I could be a bit more you know slow I, I could slow those stories down a bit because I had the tension in the present so the the present storyline goes backwards and the and the and the past storyline goes chronologically forward and then in the end of the book the two storylines meet in the last chapter so that's the frame of of the book you could say which sounds simple <laughs> in a way one goes forward one goes backward but as a writer i kind of can't imagine tracking those scenes especially in fiction I mean, did you do it? Like, did you have a giant board that you put scenes on and moved around like a filmmaker? Yes, that, that was also like the, you know, a dream I had when I was a kid that, you know, sometime, someday I'm going to be a writer that ha has this, you know, is it called post-it signs in the States? Because mm -hmm. post called that. Okay. Like this? So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But that was the, yeah. the dream to have a, a wall full of post-it signs. And I also, and, and I had that. I was sitting here. I can show you. Yeah. Here's my desk. And then, uh, can you see it? Yes. And, and here is a, uh, this wasn't here then. The whole wall was full of, you know, post-its where I, you know, made the story so I could, uh, you know, connect these two storylines to, to each other. And it was so exciting to be, to be that, that kind of writer because I, I so much before wrote very simple stories about things happening in my life or and stories that I found very chronological and very direct. But here I wanted to experiment a bit. So it was very exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm inspired by that because right now I'm in the middle of the book tearing my hair out about structure. Yeah. And when I hear that, I feel um, like taking vitamins, like, okay, I can do it. <laughs> why, what's the challenge in your book with the structure? Oh God, no, this is not about me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm just curious because I want to know everything about every uh, author's okay. you know, challenges. So, okay, so my, my structural problem is that I'm telling a riveting story about the 18th century and about rivalry, but so much information has to be fed all the time to make things make sense. So how yeah. to not make it, how to make it a riveting swashbuckling tale while not being too pedantic, but but putting in enough information that people can follow what's happening politically, what's happening historically, et cetera. So that's and my how, problem. And how do you do it then? <laughs> um, right now I'm doing it by uh, writing letters to a dead person in the middle of the story. Uh, <laughs> And explaining it that way so that my my contemporary self can drop into the into the past and say yeah. it's like this it's like this it's like this so you maybe it's it. yeah maybe oh. we'll see um this is my my daughter charlie she wants to say hi hello hello from san francisco you're from san francisco oh. but you should come know. tell your father to take you <laughs> it's a little bit late there Yes, that's why I, I need to explain. I'm so sorry, but here in Sweden, it's uh, 10 o'clock at night and uh, I, I have to be at home. So I have three kids here that are, you know, running around making noise. So that's, you know, if, if it's noisy, I'm sorry about it. And because it's very late here. It's good for people to see art takes place where life takes place. Exactly. They don't have to be separate. But, um, then, but, but then you solved it with the letters, right? I hope so. We'll see. We'll see. I'll send you a copy when it comes out. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I think it would be nice, like now might be a good time for you to read a little bit. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for doing all of these interviews in English. I know it's, you know, it's not, it's not easy, especially 10 o'clock at night. Um, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but I have to tell you, I told you before, it's such a sad thing because I am I am uh, working with words, and in English I have maybe seventy four percent of the words that I know uh, in Swedish. So I feel I mean uh, so I feel twenty six percent more stupid talking to you than I'm actually is. So you have to you know uh, imagine me being a bit more you know spiritual and funny and smart because I can be, but I don't have the words for it in English. No, you're doing fabulously, fabulously, okay. fabulously. Okay, um, so 
I can write now. I, I, I can read now a, a, a bit, uh, a small part. It's about three, the three brothers. Uh, they are now seven, nine, or, and 12. Uh, and uh, they are at the summer country house in the, in the middle of the forest in the, the north of Sweden. And uh, the father in the story comes up with an idea for a swimming contest between the kids. The parents are outside drinking wine and and, uh, and they're a bit, you know, they're, it, it's one of those long summer nights in Sweden where the sun is uh, setting very late. Okay. The rules are simple, he said, uh, that is the dad, uh, towering in front of the, the three brothers where they stood, skinny legs sticking out of their bathing trunks. On my signal, my boys will leap into the water swim around the buoy out there and return to land. And the first one backs wins. The boys lined up. Everyone understand, he said. This is it, the moment we find out which brother is the fastest. Benjamin slapped his skinny thighs as he'd seen athletes do before crucial competitions on TV. Hold on, dad said, taking off his watch. I'll time you. Dad's big thumbs poked at the tiny buttons of the digital watch, and he mumbled, damn it, to himself when he couldn't get it to work. He glanced up. On your marks. A scuffle between Benjamin and Pierre uh, for the best starting position. No, stop it, Dad said. None of that. Then let's just forget it, said Mom. She was still at the table, refilling her glass. The brothers were seven, nine, and 13. And when they played soccer or cards together these days, sometimes their fights were so bad that Benjamin felt like some, something between them was breaking. The stakes were even higher when dad pitted the, the brothers against each other, when he made it so clear that he wanted to find out which of his sons was best at something. On your marks, get set, go. Benjamin dashed for the lake with his two brothers close on his heels, into the water. He heard shouts behind him, mom and dad cheering from the shore. Bravo, come on. A few quick steps and the sharp rocks disappeared beneath him. The cove had a June chill and a little farther out were the strange bands of even colder water that came and went as if the lake were a living being that wanted to test him with different kinds of cold. The white styrofoam buoy, styrofoam, is that, is that the word? Yeah, styrofoam. styrofoam. Mm -hmm. The white styrofoam buoy lay still on the mirrored surface ahead of them. The brothers had set it out a few hours earlier when they were dropping nets with their father, but Benjamin didn't remember it being so far out. They swam in silence to preserve their energy three heads in the black water, the shouts from the beach fading into the distance. After a while, the sun vanished behind the trees on the opposite side. The light grew dim. They were suddenly swimming in a different lake. Without war warning, Benjamin found the water foreign. All at once, he was aware of everything happening beneath him, the creatures in the depth that might not want them there. He thought of all the times he'd sat in the boat with his brothers as dad plucked fish from the net and tossed them into the bottom. And the brothers leaned in to look at the razor sharp little fangs of the pike, the spiny fins of the perch. One of the fish flopped and the brothers jumped and shrieked and dad, startled by the sudden cries, shouted back in alarm. Then calm returned and he muttered, as he wound up the nets. You can't be afraid of fish boys. Now Benjamin thought about these beings swimming right alongside him or just below him, hidden by the murky water. The white buoy, suddenly pink in the sunset, was still far away. After a few minutes of swimming, the starting lineup had spread out. Nils was well ahead of Benjamin, who had left Pierre behind. But when darkness fell and the chill began to sting their thighs, the brothers closed ranks again. Soon they were swimming in tight formation. 
maybe it wasn't conscious and maybe they would never admit it to each other, but they would not leave anyone behind in the water. Their heads were sinking closer toward the surface. The reach of their arms became shorter. At first, the water had frothed with the brothers' strokes, but now the lake was quiet. When they reached the buoy, Benjamin turned around to look at the cottage. The house looked like a red Lego brick in the distance. Only now did he realize how far the return trip was. The exhaustion hit him out of no nowhere. He couldn't lift his arms for all the lactic, lactic acid. He was so surprised that he seemed all of a sudden to have forgotten how to move his legs. A bolt of cold ra radiated from the back of his neck into his head. He could hear his own breaths, how they were growing shorter and more labored and an icy realization filled his chest. He wasn't going to make it back to the, to the shore. He could see Nils craning his neck to keep from getting water in his mouth. Nils, Benjamin said. Nils didn't react, just kept swimming with his eyes on the sky. Benjamin made his way up to his older brother and they breathed hard in each other's faces. Their eyes met and Benjamin saw a fear he didn't recognize in his brother's gaze. Are you okay? He asked. I don't know, he gasped. I don't know if I can do this. Nils reached for the buoy and held onto it with both hands to float on it, but it couldn't bear his weight and sank into the, into the darkness beneath him. He gazed towards the land. I can't, Nils mumbled. It's too far. Benjamin searched his memory for what he'd learned in swimming lessons. We have to stay calm, he told Nils. Take longer strokes, longer breaths. He glanced at Pierre. How are you doing, he asked. I'm scared, Pierre said. Me too, Benjamin replied. I don't want to die, Pierre cried. His moist eyes just above the surface. Come here, Benjamin said. Come by me. The three brothers moved closer in the water. We'll help each other, Benjamin said. They swam side by side in the direction of the house. Long strokes, said Benjamin. We'll take long strokes together. Pierre had stopped crying and was now swimming doggedly alongside them. After a while, they found a common rhythm. We're taking common strokes. They breathed out and breathed in, long breaths. Benjamin looked at Pierre and laughed. Your lips are blue. Yours too. They flashed quick grins at each other and returned to concentrating. Head above the surface, long strokes. When they were only 15 yards away, Nils sped up, crawling wildly. Benjamin cursed his sluggish surprise and set off after his brother. Suddenly, the lake was no longer quiet as the brothers fierce battle to reach the shore intensified. Pierre was soon hopelessly behind. Nils was one stroke ahead of Benjamin when they reached land, and they ran up, up the hill side by side. Benjamin yanked at Nils' arm to pass, and Nils tore himself loose with a fury that shocked Benjamin. They made it to the patio. They looked around. Benjamin took a few steps towards the house, and peered through one of the windows. And there he caught a glimpse of dad's figure, his broad back bent over the dishes. They went inside, Benjamin said. Nils stood with his hands on his knees, catching his breath. Pierre came up the hill, panting. His confused gaze aimed at the empty table. They stood there at a loss, the brothers. Three anxious breaths panting in the silence. Beautiful. You capture the reality of sibling relationships so well in one scene, that love and care and fighting and tooth and claw that yeah. can often be the, the sibling reality. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's uh, maybe, um, I, I, I don't know, in my childhood, we were 
three brothers and we had uh, uh, a, a loss of uh, love you could say in the um, in the family they were i mean love existed but only in small doses so the three boys had to uh, fight fight for it and um, and um, we ended up you know fighting for for it so much that we fought each other to 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 get the small amounts of love that there were and i think that's what happens when you know in a family like that if there is not a enough amount of love then the boys the siblings turn on each other's and that's a sad thing i think i mean alcoholism is part of this story and part of your story um do you think that's i mean we have a question from a question uh, from a, a listener right now saying where do you draw inspiration from um you know life is obviously informing your fiction was that was that quite particular the, the alcoholic parent um yeah I think, yeah i i mean i i i get the inspiration from um from what happens in my life and always when i feel that something happens to me that it's maybe almost unbearable then i i need to dig into it i i got the idea for for the whole book when i was having a lunch maybe it was 2018 or something with my two two brothers in a restaurant called Sturehof. if you come to sweden you have to go there it's a very nice place okay it's just 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 over there maybe 50 yards and uh and uh, we hadn't met we hadn't met for a long time and uh, we don't hate each other uh, but you but we feel like we're strangers in a way and that's so that's so strange because we were so close in the childhood and now it's like we're we don't know each other and we sat down and we and we had a a beer and we started to talk you know polite conversations and then i asked my my bigger brother niklas uh how are things with your girlfriend and he replied oh we broke up and i said oh that's terrible how how are you and then he answered uh oh, no i'm fine we broke up half a year ago and I, <laughs> you know it was i was so sad that i didn't know i i didn't i don't even know the basic things about my 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 brothers and when i left that lunch i i felt this strange sorrow how could that be how how could we that share shared everything uh, drifted apart so much that i don't know even know the basic things about them mm -hmm. and that was very painful and and it was you know going in, into that pain that i started to write so to answer the question i always try to to um, go to places where it hurts have they read this book i uh, yeah yes yes of course they um um it's a it's a it's two different stories with my two brothers the uh, the younger one kalle uh, is very active he's uh, also very good you know in e editing so i i want him to read and to come with this, with the ideas for how to develop the book and everything but my bigger brother is more you know is not into that kind of a thing so when i finished the books uh, this book i send it to him but th there were things there that i you know i i mean uh, for example i was always so disappointed in my bigger brother um, because i always thought that he you know checked out uh, from the traumas when when we were kids i always had the idea that if you have a bigger brother then he is going to protect you uh, in the same way that i tried to protect my younger brother uh, to i mean to things that happened to us i mean my role i felt was to tell him that everything is going to be fine when we when we were hiding in a closet or something when my parents were angry or fighting or but my bigger brother just you know he just left 
And I was so disappointed in that, but I didn't have the courage. I never had that the courage to to uh, confront him with that. So in a way, you could say that I confronted him in the book because I have this theme in the book is is the same. The bigger brother is the one who checks out. He just say this is a madhouse, and he just you know leaves for his for his rooms, and he leaves the two brothers alone in the madness. And um, and uh, I remember when he read the book and he called me and. And he said, we need to talk. And I said, yes, we do. And we we met up at a cafeteria and we were like crying for hours. Mm. And it was so strong. But I mean, because I felt both like a coward that I couldn't, you know, talk to him about this, that I had to write a book about it. You know, it's, I felt bad about it. But I also felt good because I I could finally understand him. I don't I have no place in blaming him for you know in the way he he survived our childhood we all do what we can and it's not his fault that you know things were as they were uh, it's my parents fault and I and and I and I was wrong to held that against him but so you can say that this book was good in a way because we 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 finally talked about these these things that we haven't talked about in decades. I mean, that's the best possible outcome one can imagine um, yeah. from a book, right? That it it affects reality in an important and positive way. And yeah. it's, kind of, it's kind of a little miracle actually. Yeah, it time. is. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, when you were reading, I, I was wondering, have you read the book in English? Have you, uh, or just in these little, these small readings, did you work with a translator? I actually want to mention the translator's name because translating is its own art. You know, it's a, uh, it's, it's an, it's an incredible thing to do. Rachel Wilson Broyles. Um, did you work with her? Did you, you know, how, how did that go? And then yeah, I also, cool. I want to invite all the listeners to ask questions. We have a few in the chat and I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask them to you after this. Yes. No, we, I, I was very involved in it, uh, because I, I mean, once again, it's the only language that, that I know because it, it's been translated into maybe uh, 30 different languages and I, I have no idea of uh, you know the quality of the translations and it's a bit scary and it's and, and I know that because we are I am I'm living in Sweden it's a very small country so most of the books that I read are translated and it's so important that it's a good translation because if it's not, then you know the book is ruined. Mm -hmm. So I was so anxious about this. So when I, you know, had the the possibility to to be able to work with with the translation, I did, and we were going through it so many times with the agent, with the publisher, and with the American publisher, and with the UK publisher. So we could, you know, and they they found things that we didn't find in in swedish and which so we altered a lot and we were working very much you know and my publisher in the states lee, Bod lee Bodreau at the double day he she, she was very involved you know because in the other countries it they just like okay here's the book well good luck uh, and then the book's out but it was a whole different thing you know coming to to penguin random house and it was so professional and i was so happy to to be working with people that really cared about the text it was fantastic i think it's an excellent translation it it really does read in a way that's both where you can feel the original language without that clunky weird like why this yeah. <laughs> um it's very good um okay well let me let's let's turn to maybe some questions from the audience um one is curious about your day-to-day -day life and how you structure your work days. I am also curious. Yeah, I am. Uh, I am okay. So it's I, I don't know if how if it's interesting, but I I try to uh, because I have three kids and they are going to be, you know, they are going to be fed and they and you have to take <laughs> care of them for a lot. So I wake up every morning at. Um, six o'clock and then i make breakfast to to the kids and we eat together and we go through their day what are they going to do and then i take the car and i and i take them to their schools and their kindergarten is that a word kindergarten yeah mm -hmm. did you have that okay yep and and then uh, i go to uh 
to uh, to my gym to work out. I am not there. You know, I, I I don't work out a lot, but I I feel that I need to move a bit before I sit down. And then at ten o'clock I sit down, and I, I have an office just down here. And then from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday I write the books, and then I work from ten to four, very effectively. I try to do it. That and is my then, exact schedule. Ten to four. Yes. It, it has to be because <laughs> if it's not, it, it's 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 ruined. Yes, then I agree. At, at four o'clock, I, I I pick up the kids from school and everywhere. We get home, we make food, uh, we watch a TV series together. Now the whole family watches Lost, the oh. old, <laughs> uh, fantastic, genius uh, uh, drama by J.J. Abrams that went on ABC, I think, in the States, right? Mm -hmm. We, I watched it, you know, at the first time it went, and now I watch it with my kids. It's a fantastic thing. And then, you know, I am with the family. They go to bed. Then I have two hours, and this is actually now. So now I'm doing this interview. But if I didn't do it, I would be over there now to to make just one hour or two uh, 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 writing. And that is only Monday to Wednesday. Then Thursday. I don't write. I write the manuscript for the podcast, and uh, Thursday evening at four o'clock, I record the, the the podcast. And then Friday, I have pushed everything aside to the Friday to have meetings or to have you know social lunches and ev everything like that that I can't afford to do in in the Monday day to Thursday schedule. And then we have the weekend. Saturday, I'm I'm free. Sunday morning, I wake up earlier to write the column for the daily daily paper, Dagens Nyheter. And then it goes on and on and on and on. And that's my life. Wait, okay, first of all, every writer listening right now needs to write that down because the regularity is essential. I think that is so brilliant. Yeah. But you think... write a column in one day every Sunday. What if you wake every up Sunday. and you're like, forget it, I'm exhausted, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, no, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, there's a, an author in Sweden called Jan Guillou, he's very famous here, not in the States, but he's, he, he is a big star here. And I, I met him once and I said, what's your advice? And then he said, never accept that you, when you say to yourself, oh, I have no inspiration, I, I have no inspiration, it's just silly, it's for amateurs, he said. Uh, it's not about having inspiration. It's just it, it's just about just to do it. You know, you can't blame on. Oh, I don't feel for it. I can't find my, my way into it. You just have to you know do it, and that was the be the best advice that I had because I had so many times before I sat down and I started and I and I was like, oh, it that doesn't feel right. You know. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. The things that, that you can do as a writer, you can you just no, it's not for me today. I have to, you know, go and have a glass of milk and it's <laughs> That's silly. The problem. Yeah. Maybe, maybe being busy helps. Yeah. You know, it maybe. helps just like focus your mind. You have this time. That's it. You don't have five days. Yeah, no, it's true. Uh, uh, do you have kids? I do. I have two, but um, they are both in college. So oh, okay. I have I have all the time now, and I actually I found it very difficult to write when my kids were little, very very difficult. Um, it's a yeah. big challenge. Yeah, I I I just without making things too political, I think you know we don't have quite the same structure. For example, kindergarten, preschool, it's not as easy here as it is in in Sweden necessarily to have childcare. That might have been part of it when my kids were younger. I didn't really have access in the same way. Okay, but, so you had to have them home. Yeah, I had them home until, or or then I had to have a really good paying job to afford <laughs> childcare. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I did. I do find that Scandinavian countries do more to support artists in that way by supporting families. I think it's. Yeah. I think it's very helpful. Yeah. Uh, um, one of the speaking of Scandinavia, one of the sort of light motifs in the book is Midsummer, which yeah. is a big big holiday. Is that can I say that maybe, uh, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a big deal in the summer, longest day of the year in Scandinavia. It's, you know, sunny, gorgeous people go on vacation. It's a family time and sort of the, 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 the terrible thing that happens at the heart of the book 
happens on Midsummer. And, you know, um, can you say a little bit maybe about, about that piece? Why, why that day? Maybe it's obvious why that day. Um, do you think it resonates more maybe with your audience there than here? Yeah, I don't, maybe, yeah, I, I, I don't know. In Sweden, it's so, it's so common with the, with the midsummer. Every time I talk to people from outside uh, Sweden, at least, I mean, in the southern part of the, the Europe or something like that, they're intrigued that that it's so light because you have the feeling i think that sweden is very dark and it is i mean look at outside, look outside now it's <laughs> completely dark well it's 10 o'clock at night so it is yeah. but if this would have been midsummer night <laughs> right. it would have been sun out right. outside right. and that's the crazy thing and you've been in norway so you know what that is mm -hmm. it's fantastic i mean it's Great. i mean yeah. because i i just hate this i hate the darkness and i hate uh, the time that we're in now that you're going into more and more darkness i i i i'm dying inside but when it's midsummer it's like the craziest thing because you have all the summer uh, uh, ahead of you it's like the 17th of june yeah. so you have all the vacation left you have everything in front of you and you're sitting you know outside and it's 11 o'clock at night, you, see, you still can see the sun and you're having a glass of wine with your best friends and your family. And it's like, it, you have the feeling of that life, life has no ending, you know, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. So it's the, the brightest, most joyful day. And I wanted to, you know, contrast that in the book with, with an experience, with uh, an episode that it's, you know, the darkest of dark. So that's why I, I put them together. It, it, it's also a sadness because the midsummer, it's also the, it's the lightest day of the year, but it's also the day when it turns. When exactly. The next day. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a little less light. <laughs> yes, it's one and a half minutes darker. And that's nothing, but I can feel that, you know, the day after midsummer, it's like a mm -hmm. small, a small feeling of, you know, sadness because now, we're on a downhill slope towards dark darkness. So I think that's a very exciting day. And, and you have this movie in the States called Midsummer. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd seen it. I haven't seen it. It's supposed to be fantastic though. No, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. I mean, no one, you must, you must know that, that that is not Swedish Midsummer. <laughs> it's like crazy, but, um, but it's, I, lo I love the movie because it's so experimental and it's so, you know, it's so fun. And they also have these light, light nights that I, you know, it's 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 like midnight and and it's daylight outside. It's it's crazy. That's why I, I love this country so much. I mean, it must have been funny to see that movie with Swedish subtitles when yeah. they're supposed to be in Sweden. Yes. Was that weird? But and some of the actors were also so were Swedish. I know were one of them, and uh, he, he was telling me before it was it, it came out. I'm doing a film called Midsummer, and I didn't know the magnitude of it. I thought it was like an indie movie coming out, you know, in the UK or something. And then it was like this great, massive success. And I was, it was like, it was so crazy because so many people are, are telling me that they want to go to Sweden now to experience Midsummer, and they think that it's like that, you know, where people dying, falling off cliffs, and it's like <laughs> crazy. Well, maybe there'll be a, you know, a reenactment um, movement that will be yeah. great. Yeah. Um, what else? I mean, what what are you working on now? Like this book, when did you finish it? If it's already translated, it must have been out in Sweden for quite a while. Yes, are you working on a new piece? Out, yes, it came out last September, and I've been doing. I've been writing on the next novel for quite some time, and and I'm now. It's uh, it's uh, happening. The story is happening on a train this time, and yeah, it's a train train in you know, midsummer times passing through Sweden. And uh, I follow three different stories on that train. And it's about, uh, I, I, I always wrote about, you know, very uh, um, a sadness that is individual, an individual uh, sadness. Now I write, I try to write about, the, you know, the bigger sadness, maybe the sadness of being, being uh, uh, alive or mm -hmm. uh, a human being 
the existential sadness of the meanings, the meaninglessness of existing. And uh, I'm trying to write a bit of a bigger story that uh, takes place during 80 years. I've been so much, you know, into the details of what happened that summer day. Now I wanted to you know, explore what happened in that life. So I'm I'm trying to write a bigger story this time. I, I mean, not bigger, but you know, more ex an expanded story. Maybe I mean, more this, epical. This is maybe the the observation of someone who's not Swedish, but I immediately think of Ingmar Bergman. Yeah. And uh, do you find yourself influenced by film? Yes, uh, I mean, for but sure. as soon as I as soon as I hear Train, I mean, I really feel the sort of cinematic movement. Yeah. No, but I always see things. I always see my scenes. My I I start up with I'm seeing this image of like in the beginning beginning of the book. Yeah, it opens and, very very much like a movie. Yes, it's yeah. three three men crying and they're bleeding, and that's a picture that I have. And then I paint that picture into words. Mm -hmm. So I very much paint. I I very much write the pictures that I have in 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 my head. That that's why it it becomes very scenic. I think. And uh, I'm very influenced by movies. I love Ingmar Bergman. I even, you know, I bought a house in, in, on his island outside of, of Sweden in the Baltic Sea because I wanted to, you know, be in, in that uh, aura, that ambiance of Ingmar Bergman. Wow. And I, just, I just now bought, uh, watch, it goes in, in the States, the scenes of a marriage. Have yeah, you seen I, I yeah. I, well, I've seen the original movie. I just saw that it was remade. I haven't seen the remake. Oh, it's a fantastic remake. I mean, oh, I'm going to see it. They changed everything, but they made it so. It's like, it's like so courteous to Ber to Bergman, but they also made something completely new. I'm so I'm so impressed of how of wow. how they made it. It's okay, fantastic. that's really high praise to hear that from you. I have to yes, say. Yes, I mean. I mean, take it from someone who knows his Bergman. That's a, <laughs> that's a good adaptation. What's your favorite Bergman movie? I think Pashuana. Have you seen it mm -hmm. with yes. uh, uh, Liv Ullmann? And no, uh, I, I think she's it's, fantastic. Uh, fantastic. And I and I and I stumbled into her one day in Stockholm, and I was so I mean, it was crazy. And then I I uh, had dinner with her. <laughs> it was like a I was amazing. A yes, and I said, "Do you want to have dinner with dinner with me?" Uh, I mean, not in a, a romantic yeah. way. No, just, no. you know, I just wanted to <laughs> talk to her. And uh, and then I got to know her daughter, Lynn Ullman, that wrote this book mm -hmm. about you know. She's her fantastic. Up. Yeah, have you fantastic. have you read her? Yes, mm -hmm. and actually, she's spoken in the Bay Area a couple of times. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. If you can still fa find these interviews, you have to, you, you have to get to know her because she, I think that she is, you know, besides Knausgård and a, a few others, the the most interesting author in the Scandinavian area. She is uh, there. There is a a book called the the Oroliga in Swedish. I don't know the English. I don't know it either. I, don't know. I think it's translated, and if it is. It's uh, it it came out maybe 2014, mm -hmm. and if you're you're happy, if you want to you know get to know her, uh, read that book. It's also about her. You know, it's about her father in my right. Background, so I remember when it came out. I and I so I just want to be clear for uh, American people who are watching that this is Lynn Ullmann, who is the daughter of Liv Ullmann and Ingmar Bergman, and she's yes. a Norwegian novelist and fantastic yes. writer. Yes. Because we kind of jumped around quickly. Yes, quickly. yes, yes, of course. Good, very good. Uh, let's see. So um, that's your next book, and you're going to continue to write your uh, column. And what about the podcast? The Troubled. Okay. Oh, the good. Troubled. Yeah. Very good. That's right, uh, that's thank right. you, Kim, Kim Bale. Uh, and I, also, I, Kim Bale is, Beale is a writer, an American writer. <laughs> okay. I have and, to get to know her too. You which, do. Which, which book should I start with? Uh, she has a book called Good Pictures that is fantastic. And I can't put my hands on it immediately, but um, okay. uh, writes about photography. Wonderful writer. Great. No, I'm going to continue with, with the podcast. And I, I mean, I, I, but I really need to, uh, to, to write this novel because I, 
I'm I I I I think that I'm into a good story, and I also have this. I I I'm more and more into stru structure, how to you know still write in a way that I think it's good writing. If you could talk about you know writing in that way, but but still have you, you know can. an eye for an uh, an eye for a reader. You know I I I, I love to. To, to 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 surprise people that that uh, reads my books and I want to continue with that. I was very surprised. In oh, you were? Yes. Okay. Like you didn't see it coming. Stunned. I did not see it coming. And <laughs> I didn't even see anything coming. I just thought it was what it was. I didn't oh. I didn't know there was going to be a twist. It's exciting, everyone. So pick up the survivors. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we can turn it over to Jack. So this is the this is the last the last moments if folks have a question for us to to answer. Um, thank you so much, uh, Alex and Bridget, for the conversation today. Uh, it was fantastic. I feel like we could have gone on for another half an hour, forty five minutes at least. Um, uh, thanks to everyone who is watching, uh, and also thank you to our sponsors, Center for the Art of Translation, the uh, Barbara Osher Prosuisia Foundation, and our presenting partner, the. Uh, Swedish consulate here in San Francisco. Um, our event, uh, oh, I see here's a question. Is this talk recorded? It is recorded. You can also, you can watch it immediately on our Facebook page at Liquid's Facebook page, and it will be archived on our YouTube channel at uh, uh, in, in the very near future. Um, so there you have it. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Please buy Alex book, Alex's book, uh, if you can, and Bridget's when it comes out next year, right? Yes, but you yes. can buy any of my books anytime. Or, and of course, <laughs> the other books are also available. Exactly. <laughs> um, fantastic. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, and have a great day. Thanks. You too. Thanks so, so nice much, to meet you, me. Alex. Bye. You too. Bye bye.